Hey friends, welcome back to Practical Bible Living, where we are studying the gospel according to John. Uh, we are continuing our study in chapter 9, and today we're looking at verses 24 through 34. Now so far it's just been very satisfying to read and study the gospel. And keep in mind that as we are focused on studying the gospel according to John, we've actually, really, we've been actually studying the whole Bible you know, because we're everywhere we read, we're compelled to look at supporting verses and events throughout the Bible that have everything to do with the gospel. And so, as we continue, uh, keep this in mind because it's important that we look uh, and reach out and see uh, these other passage, uh, passages that relate to exactly what we're talking about because it shows us how wonderful and how continuous and how complete and how thorough and how perfect and consistent the Word of God is. See? And so it's just been a wonderful journey so far, and today uh, we continue that path. We're looking uh, at chapter 9, jumping right in to verse 24. So let's go. So we read in uh, verse 24 the following. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Now that's being said by the Pharisees, of course. Now, back in verse 15, okay, we saw that the Pharisees had asked the man who was formerly blind about how he had received his sight. Though by their questioning and their response, we could perceive that this was a kind of interrogation more than an innocent inquiry, right? They refused to believe, saying that this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath, speaking, of course, about Jesus who healed the man. Now, after having said that, they questioned the man who was formerly blind a second time in verse 17 with the focus this time on what the man himself, the blind man who was healed, what he himself says about Jesus, saying to him, What do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. So you see, what they are doing there is clear. They had just declared to him their opinion that Jesus is not from God. Now they follow up with this second question purposely to test the man, to see if he will agree with them, okay, or if he will oppose them as his religious leaders. You see, this is a kind of interrogation. Then, after the man who was formerly blind said that he believed that Jesus was some kind of prophet, we read that they did not believe him, so they brought in the man's parents, who were only partly helpful, confirming that they are his parents, and he was born blind, but purposely hiding their knowledge or opinion of who Jesus is because of their own stony hearts. And we spoke about that in detail in the prior discussion, about how they uh, were trying to keep themselves from being condemned by the Pharisees lest they lose uh, their privileges uh, through the synagogues and in the temple. Now, this brings us back to verse 24 here that we just read once again, with which uh, we start off today's discussion. So yet another time here, now, we see that the Pharisees press on the man, you know, shoving their opinion over him, insisting that he give glory to give God the glory. You see, they're insisting that he give God the glory and bypass Jesus. Because yet, yet again here, they call him a sinner once again. Well, what nobody's pointing out here is that Jesus is God. He is God the Son. And giving Jesus the glory for what he did is the same as giving God the glory. Now, Let's say that they, the Pharisees, being ignorant, want the man to give God, the Father, all the glory for this miracle rather than Jesus. Would that be okay? Well, you have to consider this question because there are people today who would love to mislead you in this way exactly, telling you 
that the God of the three main big religions of today is actually the same God, and that even all the religions in one way or another serve the same God, and that you don't need to go through Jesus or anyone else, but rather you could reunite and pray together and give the God of heaven the praise and glory. Well, now, you and I know how deceptive that is, right? Because we have seen over and over that Jesus is the door and the way to heaven, right? Just like John 14, 6, when Jesus said the following, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See that? And so many, okay, many are the things which the Lord said regarding who he himself is in relation to his Father in heaven. And so shame on us or anyone else to think that we can just skip over Jesus and get to the Father. The Father will not accept your prayer, nor will he accept your requests, nor will he acknowledge any salvation for you except it be through Jesus Christ. That is the importance of the gospel, and that is why we are making no shortcuts in our study so that it's established and made totally clear. Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, is one with God the Father in heaven. If you do not go through Jesus Christ, then the God you are searching for is not the same God in heaven, but rather a false God. And that my friends, will be made totally clear and evident to you during the judgment so that you have no excuse and are completely clear about your condemnation and why you're not receiving eternal life, but rather eternal death. Because you ignored the words of eternal life, which are written for you and made available for you. You know, it's not a coincidence that these messages have been made available for you to hear or that this or that has been heard by your ear. Or you've seen this post, or you've seen that post, and it was brought before you, right before your eyes, so that you could read the truth. None of that's a coincidence. But rather, it is the gracious and merciful God who keeps his promises. Okay, He keeps his promise that you, yes, you personally, you personally, will have been given every opportunity to know the truth. Such that if you deny it and turn away from it, okay, that it will be the evidence against you, despite that no evidence is even needed when the Lord himself righteously judges, because he is God and his righteousness is already established. So this was an important point to make, because I know that some of you are appointed to hear this at this time, okay? So looking at our passage here, The Pharisees are insisting that he skip over Jesus and give God the glory. And so we know that what they are suggesting to the man who was formerly blind is that he should ignore the gospel. See, that summarizes it right there. They're telling him to ignore the gospel. And that, by the way, is the sneaky suggestion of the devil, which nobody should take. Now, after making that statement to him, they add yet, Another time, saying, they know that this man is a sinner. And they are, by by the way, blinded. They are blinded because they are declaring Jesus to be a sinner by what standard? You see, what standard are they using to make that claim? The standard they're using to declare Jesus a sinner is their own tradition and their own interpretation of God's commands, which is faulty. You see, their own interpretation is faulty. And we know that the traditions of men's religions are often unbiblical in this way. Now, it brings us to verse 25 where we read, He answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, okay, one thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. You see, now it was the man's turn here to respond to the Pharisees again. And so he brings back the important point onto the table. You see, 
That point is this, that he, this man who was healed, does not judge Jesus with regard to whether he is a sinner or not, but rather there is one thing that he knows that though he was blind, now he sees. And in a way, I can see how this may be perceived as a kind of slap in the face to the Pharisees because he has disregarded their declaration that Jesus is a sinner despite them being the religious leaders trying to lord themselves over him. You see, the expectation of the Pharisees is this. This is what they're thinking and what they're expecting. This, if we say he is a sinner, then he is a sinner. And so anyone, okay, who thinks otherwise goes against us. And therefore, they are blaspheming against the leaders and against the temple. You see, that's their mindset. That's what these power-hungry Pharisees are expecting everyone to believe and to abide by. Now, not only does the man disregard their declaration of Jesus being a sinner, but the man cleverly just returns to the table the fact that he was blind and now he can see. End of story. As he put it, that's the one thing that he knows. So, What was their response? Well, let's read in verse 26. In verse 26, we read the following. And then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? So they responded as directed by the man, rather than the man responding as directed and prompted by the Pharisees. You see how that happened? Instead, Because of what the man said, bringing their attention back to the fact that a great miracle has just happened. Their response, in turn, is to ask him yet again another time. What did Jesus do to you? How did he open your eyes? And so the man was right to disregard their false declaration about Jesus being a sinner which was really just to confuse him and and reroute him along their own thinking. See, he was right to disregard that. And rather, putting forth the evidence in front of them again. You see, keeping the focus on the truth of what happened, because that is something they cannot deny. So be careful, by the way, in your walk with the Lord through your life, okay, in the short time that's remaining. If you are redirected and asked all kinds of questions about your faith in an attempt to make you stumble, you just bring back the truth of the gospel each time. You put that on the table. Ignore the false attacks which are truly from spiritually demonic origin and always return with the truth, the word of God. Just like the Lord, by the way, when he was tempted in the wilderness by the devil, He did not entertain the devil's suggestions for even a second, but always returned responding with what was written in the scriptures. See that? You have to keep control and lead of the discussion. The Pharisees put him in the defendant's seat in the court. You see, the defendant is the one who's being accused, right? And has to defend himself. See, the Pharisees are putting this man in the defendant's seat in their little court here that they've uh, imagined. As though he is the accused who must defend himself. But rather, what the man does, he reverses this here, putting them in the defendant's seat, needing to explain the miracle that happened by the hand of Jesus Christ. And by the way, you know, Jesus did this very well throughout the gospel. Whenever he was questioned by the Pharisees, And uh, it's not difficult to do when you are truly the one who has the truth. Now, this brings us to verse 27, where we read the following. He, that is, the man who was healed, he answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Now, this poor man who was just healed, he acknowledges that they have nothing more to say, but rather they keep asking the same questions despite him already answering them and telling them all that he knows. 
He even asks them a good question, saying, why do you want to hear it again? Now, he follows this up with asking something that you know is really going to aggravate them, saying, do you also want to become his disciples? Now, we can, we can find his question a little humorous and even clever because we know they cannot stand Jesus and what Jesus is doing. They can't stand him. They are so envious and jealous of him. You see, all the people have flocked to Jesus to hear his words and his teachings and to be healed by him. Meanwhile, the Pharisees feel their authority is slipping away and their credibility of the scriptures is being undermined. So we can pretty much expect their response to what the man just said to them, right? Let's read verse 28 and 29 together here. We read the following. Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. So, they reviled the man. Okay? They reviled him. The word revile means to subject someone to verbal abuse. Or, another way to say it, is to criticize someone in an, in an abusive or angrily insulting manner. Okay? To criticize someone in an abusive and angry and insulting manner. That's how they responded to the man here. But recall what the Lord taught the crowds about being reviled by others because of his sake. That is, the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. We could take a look at that. The Lord spoke on this. Using the word reviled even. Let's take a look at Matthew 5.11 when the Lord spoke to the crowds, uh, giving them this wonderful, wonderful uh, talk known as the, uh, giving them the beatitudes or the blessings. And so let's just read this here. Uh, we'll read uh, verse 11 and 12 together. The Lord says to the crowd, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice! And be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see that? So, here, they reviled him also. They reviled the man. Okay? So it's expected. The man is reviled for the sake of Jesus Christ. You see? But the Lord says... Blessed is he because of it. And, of course, those today who are reviled, okay, they're reviled in the world, by the world, okay, by other people, because of the name of Jesus Christ, for witnessing about him, don't be discouraged, because know that the Lord who has his eye upon you every second says, Blessed are you. He says to you, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Be glad even. Glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Just like those who were before you. You know, it's because you are like soldiers or knights in armor who stand up for the king. Okay, You're standing up for your king in battle, for the honor of the king. And doing it in the face of abuse and in the face of trials and persecution, the Lord has the reward for this soldier or this knight who does these things. The reward is awaiting you. Just like any soldier who's injured in war today returns and they're given the Purple Heart Medal or the Medal of Honor for their bravery and their loyalty despite everything they've been through, despite the wounds, despite their sufferings. But by the way, those are earthly, okay, worldly rewards. But the reward in heaven goes far beyond what we can even imagine. And surely, 
It's enough that we are found worthy even to enter into the kingdom of God. But the Lord is so wonderful, he encourages us with the promise of rewarding each one of us for their work and the good things that they have done in their life. Okay, For his sake and in his name, the name of Jesus Christ. Not just any work. You see, if you suffer in the world, and the Bible tells us this, okay, what are you gaining in heaven if you suffer in the world for doing something evil or doing something bad? No, you're being punished for doing evil. But when you suffer in the world for doing good, because of the name of Jesus Christ, blessed are you. Now, after they reviled him, okay, what did they do? They went back to their old, stale way of thinking, okay, which the Lord spent so much time condemning them about, which is this. They again invoke the name of those who they call their fathers. Again. Again. Replacing the Lord Jesus. You see? And that's sadly what a lot of people do today, and we talk a lot about that. You see, we have to expose those things. They have their own fathers. They name their churches after other people rather than the Lord. They read their, their books, their own books and meditate on their own writings, the writings of their fathers, which, you see, give, it gives almost no time to the actual scriptures, the Word of God. You can even say that they replace their identity of being followed, of being followers, they replace their identity of being followers and disciples of Jesus Christ to instead being followers of their own fathers. Some make themselves clearly Father, uh, followers and disciples of their own father, fathers and their own saints. See that? The same mistake of the Pharisees here is what people do today. And I pray that the Lord opens their eyes. I really do. I really do pray for them. Because I would be filled with so much joy to see the Lord being restored to them as their identity and to hear the scriptures being studied throughout the whole prime time liturgies when everyone is present during the prime time of church when people come and attend why not use that time to spend studying the scriptures together and even you know rename churches as the churches of Jesus Christ our shepherd and not the name of any other man. You know, our Lord Jesus says he will write his name on our foreheads. But we can't even write his name on what we call his churches. How shameful is that? These days I am even more confused when I enter into churches because you would have to look hard when you enter to find a painting of Jesus. Or something to remind you of Jesus, because instead, in many of these places, what you're greeted with at the entrance is paintings and images of everyone else. Pictures of other men, and you'd have to struggle to go and find a painting of Jesus. And that says it all right there. The priorities. You know, it's true. And by the way, by the way, it makes me sad. And that's why I speak about it. And by the way, the Apostle Paul himself was saddened by it also. And he spoke about this very thing. You know, we could take a little journey here, right, very quickly to 1 Corinthians, the letter to the Corinthians from St. Paul. Okay, chapter 1, verse 11 through 15, where he's speaking to them about these things. We read, For it has been declared to me, Concerning you, my brethren, speaking to the churches, okay? Concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? 
Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. You see what he's doing there? Just like the Pharisees kept making their identity based on men whom they call their fathers, and the Lord Jesus rebuked them for it. You see, the Apostle Paul here rebukes the churches for doing the same thing. In fact, those churches even boasted in it. They should say, instead, I am of Christ. But they don't. They divide. They boasted. They boasted in making their identity that of men, invoking their names, the names of men. And so the Apostle Paul asks them openly, were any of those men crucified for you? Well, I would say that the Apostle Paul is asking you who's hearing this the same thing. Were these men, whose pictures are posted on the wall, with even the Lord Jesus absent, were they crucified for you? When you consider the name of your church, who you made your identities, were they crucified for you? We should say rather the church of Jesus Christ. Well, the Apostle Paul is asking you the same because you are not exempt. You have to understand that you are not exempt and your traditions are not above what is biblically called the Word of God. The true teachings of the Bible, of Jesus Christ, that is the one you read of in the Bible. Not the Jesus that the churches today have created who apparently approves of all their traditions. Nope, nope, not that one. But the one, the Jesus Christ that you read about in your Bible, even the teachings of the apostles, that Jesus, okay, Jesus taught them. The teachings of the apostles, which they received from Jesus Christ, which are in the Bible. Today, churches have made so many excuses for what they do, despite deviating so far from what is written. And that's because the Bible is no longer their standard, but rather everything else, as we've discussed already. But as I said, I feel sad about that because it's a sad thing when you look and see that your church doesn't look like your Bible. And I pray for them. And when one studies the Bible, you feel an obligation to point out the truth and the urgent need to repent and to turn to the ways that we are instructed through the Bible. And when spending time in His Word, the Holy Spirit opens your eyes and leads you and compels you to raise caution about things before it's too late. So shame on me if I don't speak the truth and instead hide it. I pray for them, all the churches in the world even, and you should too. And that the Lord open their eyes. But unfortunately, I don't think that can happen without purposeful Bible study with the intention to return to what is written in it because it'll require abandoning all of their other books which contain false reassurances about their traditions. See, all these other books that are not the Bible, they contain false reassurances about their traditions. You see, unbiblical writings that encourage churches to engage with a lot of these false traditions. And I say traditions because these are things they have come up with on their own and are not biblical. It's exactly what Jeremiah speaks of uh, in chapter 16, 19 of Jeremiah, and we spoke of before, where it says, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthless and unprofitable things. You see? And a lot of people today think that their fathers just can't possibly have inherited lies. Well, they'll find out. That, by the way, is how these Pharisees and the churches today have ended up in the condition that they are. That's how they ended up in this state that they're in. 
It all centers around lowering the status of Jesus in their eyes and lifting up the status of men. It cannot be denied because their fruits are evident against them, and it will be exposed in that day. Now, this brings us back to our passage, okay? And we're going to look here now at verse number 30, where we read the following. The man answered and said to them, Why? This is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from. Yet, he has opened my eyes. And how can we, by the way, how can we not agree with the man? I mean, how can what happened be from the devil? Remember what the Lord said in Mark 3:22? Let me just pull that up. Mark 3:22 through 26, right? He said this to the Pharisees when he had cast out the demons from the people. Let's take a look. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, "He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? You see that? How can the demon do good things that are against himself and his purpose? If a kingdom, in 24, is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. You see that? And so if if this miracle, which the Lord did for this blind man to give him sight, if it was done by the hand of Jesus Christ, then it must be from God. Bring back our passage here. So it must be from God. And the man says to them the truth, that it's a marvelous thing that they do not know where he is from. Meaning, it's a huge surprise that they don't know. How are they, the people, supposedly the people of God, and they can't recognize the works of God? You see, it's total blindness, actually. They're totally blind. He gained his sight, but we can see, then, how they are blind. And we go to verse 31, and we read the following. After he said that, he continues in saying here, Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. And he is correct, because Jesus does the will of the Father in heaven. If Jesus was a sinner, then he could not do anything any of the miracles that he has been doing, even raising the dead, by the way. And in 32 we read, Since the world began, it has been unheard of, it's been unheard of, that anyone opened the eyes of one who was blind. You see that? So not only did this man, who was formerly blind, redirect the issue back to focus on, on the miracle that happened, as we discussed, but now he emphasizes that they have not heard of any such miracle ever, even since the world began. So this is not a small deal. This was a huge deal. And in 33 we read, If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Agreed. But, as the man will find out in the coming verses, Jesus is not just from God, but he is God. He is God the Son. And that is the game changer. And that will change him. It will change him completely. He will be changed further when he understands this. And by the way, it changes the entire discussion for them as well. And in 34, we read the following. They answered and said to him, 
You see, they're, the Pharisees here, it's their turn to respond, and they're talking back to the man who was formerly blind and now healed. They're responding to him. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. See that? They cast him out. And so they add insult to injury. See? They're just adding insult to injury. See, they first interrogated him, okay? Then they reviled him. And then they excommunicated him from the temple. Isn't that interesting? Because that's the very thing that this man's parents were afraid of, which is why they, his parents, held back what they knew about Jesus and did not witness for him, but rather threw the weight of the issue back to their son saying, he is of age, ask him. Remember that in our discussion last time? You see, because they didn't want to be excommunicated, kicked out permanently from the synagogues and the temple, and yet, that is exactly what happened to their son as a consequence of him standing up for the truth. Isn't that all that we anticipated in the prior discussion? Remember that? In order to be in good standing with the religious system, you have to keep your mouth shut and not try to speak the truth. And so, people do sit in silence. And so, the false and unbiblical traditions get carried along generation to generation. Meanwhile, Anyone who dares to stand up and witness to the word of God, they are reviled and persecuted even by the religious system. And that, my friends, is what the Lord Jesus cautioned about ahead of time, saying that this thing would happen. Note also in verse 34, because the subject here was about sin. And the fact that the man points out that Jesus could not be a sinner because God does not hear sinners. And so the Pharisees here do that thing they always do. Having no good way of responding, they blurt at him these immature attacks like they always do, calling him a sinner, saying he's a sinner because he was born blind. And as you and I know, It doesn't even make sense to be born blind for sins that could not have even occurred yet since you were born that way. And neither does a child get punished for the sins of their parents as we have shown throughout the Bible in our first discussion in chapter 9. Here again is yet another evidence that all the scriptures are written in order for those who study it, so that we gain knowledge and understanding sequentially and in order so that we can apply it to passages that are ahead. And so, by the way, that's because the Word of God, the Lord our God, is perfect. What a joy and a blessing to study the Bible, even the Gospel. Wishing you all a blessed weekend. Until the next one.